service a couple of days ago. I hope that everyone had a wonderful Christmas, and I welcome everyone who is joining us over Zoom. I know that at the last minute we had to tamp down on the singing yesterday and last night. I, I think if we are, and we'll get rid of that echo. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. <laughs> If, uh, if we, because we are a humble gathering right now, we don't have quite as many people, uh, we can sing this morning, uh, you know, with our masks, make sure that uh, we're uh, cautious there, but uh, we will be uh, singing uh, some of the hymns today, which I really enjoy, uh, but as we celebrate Christmas on this last Sunday of 2021, I want us to take time to reflect. So originally, I thought to myself, well, this is great. We have family in town that are visiting from Cleveland, and this is a great Sunday to dedicate little Virginia, our daughter. But we are going to postpone that celebration to when we can gather more fully. Uh, and, but what we will do is remember the dedication of Jesus when he was dedicated at the temple as a young boy. If you look inside your prayer concerns, uh, or your uh, bulletins, there's an insert that has the prayer concerns list on one side, and the announcements on the other. Uh, some of the announcements are there's, we're gonna skip Bible study this Tuesday, uh, but we will start Bible study up again the following Tuesday, at, in um, the beginning of next year, and we will be starting a new book called Start Here. And it really goes over a number of very, uh, just very basic coming into faith. And so uh, that is what we will be studying coming up. And also, I want to <coughs> acknowledge a few birthdays uh, that we have, too. Uh, Dolores, of course, was born not very long ago on Christmas Eve. And the flowers are in memory of her. And, uh, her loved ones, and <clears throat> thank you, Dolores, for that. Uh, Zane Stanger certain turns five tomorrow, uh, and there's one other birthday that was celebrated yesterday. It's the Sunday school answer. It's Jesus. <laughs> and in case I'm missing anyone else, uh, then let me know. But it is <clears throat> wonderful to be gathered here in this uh, in this humble group, and it is great to see everyone here and everyone who is tuning in over Zoom. Uh, before we begin, I would like to see if there are any other uh, announcements that anyone wishes to bring forth. Welcome Chris and Lindsay and baby Al. This is when you get singled out when there's uh, this humble of a group. <laughs> it's great to see you here. It's great to see Summer here. It's great to have time for family to gather as well. And I want to begin now with the lighting of the Advent candle wreath. I know I've been asking a number of people to do so. But this morning, 
Uh, I want us to remember the birth of Christ. And what started off with a spark of hope gave us peace with gentle light. And the great joy that we have in telling the story around the fire. A story that shows us God's love. This love that has descended upon the earth. Now I invite you to uh, stand up, rise, and join with me in our responsive reading from Isaiah 60, verses 1 through 3. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Now please join with me in singing together hymn number 197, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. <laughs>
time to let go of any guilt that might be weighing our hearts down on this season. Now is the time to let go of any ways we may have transgressed, either knowingly or unknowingly, against God's righteousness and glory. And now is the time to commit ourselves to Christ once again, to living our lives to the fullest, without guilt and with pure righteousness, knowing God's will and God's way. If you are so willing, please join with me in our prayer of confession found printed in our bulletin. And this is just a way that many of us may have stumbled. Let us humble ourselves before God. Our Heavenly Father, we are humbled by the gift of life and the precious new life that we can hold in our hands. At the same time, we can become distraught and lose faith when we are faced with the aspect of life that is out of our hands. And when the life we hold faces challenges and threats, when the hardships that can come with life and experience overwhelm us, we are tempted to cast our responsibility aside and give in to sin. Forgive us, Lord, as we confess to you now our most personal sin in silence. Amen. The good news is this, though. Today we celebrate the birth of our Savior, a Savior who came to earth so that we might be forgiven and that we might share that very same forgiveness with others. That is imperative. It is a command from God that we must forgive others when they have sinned against us as well. So we remember that and accept this wonderful gift of God's grace. Now, join with me in singing to God's eternal presence and God's eternal grace, and stand now as we do so, singing the glory of Patri from the Church of Old. Christmas. Some of them involved getting presents, right? It's okay. That's a part of the tradition, an important one. Sometimes the excitement had to do with looking for people, specifically one man who held a lot of magic, searching for Santa Claus. I tried to do that a few times as a kid. <laughs> I never caught a glimpse of of the man on Christmas Eve. I did meet him in various places and, and told him what I wanted as a child, but I never caught him actually delivering presents. But 
I want to ask you, when you were excited as a child, did you see that same joy on either your parents' face or any adults that you were celebrating with that were with you? I don't know why Samantha is shaking her head no. <laughs> Look for it. Because one of the true blessings of Christmas is a family that celebrates together and to share that same excitement and joy. Now, when Jesus was born, his family was excited. Now, he was younger at a certain age, and I don't know if you remember this, at a certain age, you don't remember all of your Christmases. Al, do you remember Christmas? <laughs> Jenny, Gus is starting to remember Christmas. Jenny is still not there yet either. <laughs> and, and when we're younger, we might not remember everything. But as we grow older, we see that those who are taking care of us, those who are providing for us, those who gave us life, get so much joy from our own joy. Remember that. And know that our own joy affects others. Please join with me in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming to us, for sharing with us the gift of your birth and of your presence. Guide us along the way and bring us together as part of your holy family. Amen. Beginning with the prayer of illumination, in the book of Isaiah, it is written of the coming Messiah. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might. The spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. While God is often seen as loving and merciful, we might forget exactly what it means when the prophets speak of the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord, it is the holy reverence, awesome power, and steadfast desire for justice that comes with such mercy and compassion. The fear of the Lord, it is a stance of humility, respect, reverence, and honor. Please join me now in prayer. Almighty God, plant the seed of faith in those of us who have not yet heard your story and grow the faith of those who have received you. Open our hearts again to your story of old that comes to us anew, a story of what has come to pass and our hope in what is still to come. Amen. The first scripture lesson it comes from Psalm 145, 1 through 5. A psalm of praise of David. I will exalt you, my God and King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day, I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your work to another. They tell of your mighty act. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. This is a holy wisdom and a holy word. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture lesson is the story of the dedication of Jesus from Luke's account, chapter 2, verses 22 to 40. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it was written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, 
a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also prophet Anna, the, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then there was, and was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at the very moment, she gave them thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. This is a holy wisdom and a holy word. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank you for sharing that with us, Donna, and uh, very glad to see that you're making it up and down the steps okay. Sorry to challenge you uh, right away, uh, not so long after your surgery, but it is great to see you healing, and thank you for sharing with us such a beautiful story of God's love. God's love as it was according to tradition. And before this message, I would invite you now to join with me in prayer. Lord in heaven, may your guidance settle upon our hearts and your spirit come into our presence. Lord, continue to guide us long after we leave this place. Lord, grow and strengthen each and every one of us with great wisdom as we are your children. And remind us of that every day. Lord, Fill my heart and my lungs with your spirit and put your words in my mouth. It is in your name we pray. Amen. So the story that we heard this morning is a traditional one. It isn't about the manger directly. This was right after the manger scene, so to speak. And as it is written... The child was circumcised eight days later, as per the law of Moses in what is called a bris, and the child was named Jesus. Jesus. Thank you. That's the answer that we want. <laughs> the child was named Jesus. And not long after the bris, or the circumcision, that child, if they are the firstborn male, is taken to the temple and dedicated. And the tradition has it that that child is given to God in the church and then is purchased back with a sacrifice of two doves or pigeons. If you want the child back, most people did. <laughs> it was a lot of work to have a child. <laughs> 
So this is the story that we relate to today, and it is fitting that today is the second day of Christmas. And you all know the song. On the second day of Christmas, my true love gave to me oh, oh, two turtle doves for a sacrifice in the temple. <laughs> no, that's not how the song goes. That took a dark turn. <laughs> No, but this was, this was the tradition of the church. And that is what it is given for the life. And so, this is where Jesus was celebrated at the temple. And the sacrifice was presented. And it was a moment of celebration. And it was a moment of celebration that happened in Bethlehem. So, it wasn't their home. This, the temple was in Jerusalem, so they went to Jerusalem to have this happen before they went home to Nazareth because the temple was the central place of worship and the temple was the central place of God's presence. And it was a big deal that they were at the temple observing such tradition. Now, I know today, of course, it was, it was all fitting because I had the message planned and we were going to dedicate uh, Virginia today as well, but because we have been around a lot of people and there's sickness in a lot of different places, we have decided to put that on hold. So our traditions now might be a little more flexible than they once were. But I was talking to my uh, Jewish cousin, Dan, uh, who he, he married into the family, and he said he was very devout and he said the bris happens eight days all the time after the child is born there is no flexibility in that even if it's not uh unless there is a medical reason of course because life is treasure uh, and uh and so that that was not such a flexible tradition and this morning i want us to think about the flexibility of tradition and faith Married to the tradition. So, the flexibility of faith itself. Let me clarify that. The flexibility of faith. Married to tradition and what we have that comes from the past. Because there was an amazing moment that happened at the temple. When Joseph and Mary brought their son Jesus to be dedicated to God. There were two people there at the time. One is the uh, prophet Anna, who was a woman who had been going to the temple for years and years and years and was not married very long before her husband passed away. And she was a widow for a much longer period of time. And in her faithfulness as a widow, her dedication was to the Lord. And so she came to the temple consistently. She came to worship God consistently and to give her own life to God to encourage others. And that's exactly why God's word came to her as a prophet. And what she did was recognize this child and then tell everybody about this child. She was kind of the ultimate encourager. And I know uh, women in this church who are also really good at encouraging at spreading the word of bringing families along and the potential that is had in every child that comes through the church. So it was sort of like that, but in a much more intense and grander scale. For it wasn't just a small church. This was the temple, and it was the temple of the Lord, the one place that God had on earth. And there was also another man. His name was Simeon. We also don't know about his family background. We just know that he was alone. He was a very devout man. And he had some words to share. And they were amazing. God had revealed to him by the power of his spirit that he would see the Savior and the Messiah before he passed. And there was this child. And there was Simeon, and he knew who this child was. 
Once he saw this child, what did he say? My eyes have seen the salvation of the Lord. I can now rest in peace. But he also says something else. He takes Mary aside. And he said, this child is destined to cause the rising and the falling of many in Israel. This child will reveal the thoughts of hearts. This child also would bring a sword that will pierce your soul too. It was not exactly the same consistent, encouraging, uplifting message. It foreshadowed the ministry of Jesus that was to come. A ministry that was filled with incredible beauty, but also challenged people deeply. Simeon said what? He said, you will be a light to the Gentiles. People outside of the temple, people outside of Jerusalem, people outside of Israel will come and see this light. That was different. It was strange. And the problem, the reason why the thoughts of so many hearts would be revealed, is because that would be very hard to accept, especially for the people who were rooted in that tradition where the temple was the center of God's presence. And the temple was the place where God was. This is what was so fascinating to me about this story right here. And I think we would do very well to listen to this story in this way in a very traditional church that is healthy but still small, family, intimate. And it's great to see other family come in and feel comfortable here and have roots here and have grown up here themselves to see that message passed down from generation to generation. But also, being a traditional church, it can present challenges when we want things to remain the same, we want our expectations to be fulfilled. We want to know what is coming. We want to be prepared. <laughs> I do, sometimes. <laughs> but the problem with those expectations, if they are too rigid, is that they can reveal the thoughts of our hearts that might not see the bigger picture. What this child would do would foretell not only the falling of this temple, because people would eventually reject this child. It would foretell the changing of tradition to such a point that it wasn't even recognized as what we call Judaism. A whole new religion would come from it. But it all comes from God, and that is what Simeon would foretell. And so what do we take from this story now? And I want, to, I want us to be very, very encouraged by a story like this. It's because I'll admit that as someone who really is rooted in tradition, who respects tradition, who loves tradition, the traditions of this church, of a Presbyterian form of worship, of uh, things that are orderly, that we know about, it is important to pass on those traditions from generation to generation. But as any of us who have had kids, or any of us who have dealt with parents before, <laughs> we know that Children are different from their parents. They have their own thoughts. They have their own desires. They have their own understanding. And that can look very, very different. And that can change the world. And not only can it change the world, it will change the world. The world will change. 
And so as a faithful people, we have to recognize when that change comes and where God's will is within it. Because what looks the same today, which was admittedly very similar as it did 50 years ago, a little less similar than it was 100 years ago, might look similar 50 years from now and not at all the same 100 years from now. You know what's the same, though? God's salvation that has been seen and that message of truth that has been passed down from generation to generation. Because it is not just the tradition that is passed down from generation to generation. The thing that lasts forever, that is passed down from generation to generation, is the feeling of God's love and God's presence and an acceptance of that child. A desire for that child to thrive and a desire for that child to change the world and to turn hearts and minds to the Lord. And it might look different than what we might expect. But that is why we have to open our hearts and open our minds to every single person in the next generation. In that very same way. And that is what we celebrate. You know, my niece said yesterday, Christmas is for kids, right? <laughs> It's a holiday for kids. And it is, quite frankly. Christmas is a holiday for kids. I think it's accurate because it gives us a childlike view of the world. There's excitement of new things to have and hold. It's a day where new life is celebrated, and it's meant to be celebrated for a while. But again, as we grow older, we know that as parents, our joy comes from that next generation thriving. And what kids bring to Christmas that we constantly need to recover and rediscover is a marriage of tradition and expectation with fantastic imagination and play. Anyone who has watched kids play with toys and play with things can understand that they have such a fresh perspective that they can see something from a different angle and from a much bigger perspective and a smaller mind than ourselves. Take that to heart. Recover that imagination of not what God is or where we are now, but of what God could be. That's what we take home today. And I want us to remember the presence of Christ, who Christ was, by singing together hymn of the birth, 194, infant holy, infant lowly.
have a gift to give and you want to bring forward the offering plate is up on the center of the table. Um, and most of all, during this time, I want us to think about what we can give to the Lord as we listen to Linda play. Life eternal through the gift of your name 
and your righteousness, your example, and your body. Lord, during this season, we now lift many other names who need your presence, both silently and out loud. Tim Hathaway. Sally Barnes. Anita Bohar. Blaine Wilson. And Lord, we pray for so many others who are suffering illness right now. We pray that they recover. We pray that we are humble as a people and that we come together as a people under you and your grace and your truth. And Lord, we now continue to walk forward, praying these words that your Son taught us to pray, praying now together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now I invite us to sing together hymn number 185, Away in a Manger.
know, Dolores. <laughs> Patty's waving at you.